You know, uh, I love to preach, but I got to tell you, I've been preaching a lot this past week. I've been at Camp of the Woods, and every day I've preached at least once, and on Wednesday and Friday, I preached twice on those days. I even had a nightmare this week that I was preaching, and I woke up, and I actually was, so (laughs) I hope I don't fall asleep during this, uh, may wake up and be preaching in my sleep. We're glad you're here today, and uh, if you're like Debbie and I, you're enjoying these days of summer that we have. These are precious days indeed. In your Bible today, I would urge you to find 2 Timothy chapter 2. We're going to look at several verses there, starting in verse 1 of 2 Timothy chapter 2. Paul writing, to this young pastor, Timothy, a young man who's a pastor in Ephesus that he has helped disciple and mentor. And he says, you then, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And the things you've heard me say in the presence of many witnesses, entrust to reliable men who will also be qualified to teach others. Endure hardship with us like a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No one serving as a soldier gets involved in civilian affairs. He wants to please his commanding officer. Similarly, if anyone competes as an athlete, he does not receive the victor's crown unless he competes according to the rules. The hardworking farmer should be the first to receive a share of the crops. Reflect on what I'm saying, for the Lord will give you insight into all this. Remember, Jesus Christ, raised from the dead, descended from David. This is my gospel for which I'm suffering, even to the point of being chained like a criminal. But God's word is not chained. Therefore, I endure everything for the sake of the elect, that they too may obtain the salvation that is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. We're going to stop right there today, and in just a few moments, we're going to unpack some of those verses, especially starting in verse 5 and and following. Back in the early 1950s, no one had ever run a mile in under four minutes. And even though thousands of dedicated runners had tried, that mark had proven impossible to crack time and time again until actually very few people believed it was possible. Doctors would actually write articles in medical journals saying the human body was not meant to be pushed that far. We should not even attempt such a thing. But there was one young English medical student named Roger Bannister who believed it could be done. Bannister had been favored to win in the 1952 Olympics, but he had finished a disappointing fourth place and thought about giving up running altogether to devote his full time to medical studies. But he had a coach who believed in him, expressing the belief that he could be the first man ever to break four minutes in the mile. That had been his dream for so long, he decided to give it one last, full out, all focused, all in, no holds barred, kind of effort, studying medicine eight hours a day and training his body four hours daily left him little time for anything else. But he continued with this robust commitment month after month in grueling conditioning of his body, getting himself ready for peak performance. And finally the day came for him to try his impossible dream. The day broke cold and windy. The track was wet from five hours of rain earlier that morning. Certainly not ideal conditions. But Roger had resolved, today is the day I'm going for it. The runners went to their marks, the guns sounded, and they were off. The first quarter was run in 57 and a half seconds. The half mile in one minute, 58.2 seconds. That was a blistering pace, especially for that day. 
And it continued throughout the third lap until with only one lap remaining, the time read three minutes, one half second. Down the back stretch, around the curve, sprinting for home. Later, in describing that moment, Roger said, my head was throbbing. My lungs felt they would burst. For a brief moment, I thought, maybe I should slow up. He could have easily slowed up and still won the race. But he didn't want to just win another race. His goal was to break the record. Bearing the tremendous pain, pushing, giving it everything he had, he continued to sprint toward the finish line. He hit, he hit the tape. Now, in those days, it wasn't that real-time split-second ability that our clocks today have. So there was a small delay. But after a small delay, the time read three minutes. Ah, that's what everybody was waiting to see. Three minutes, 59.4 seconds. Pandemonium. The crowd exploded with applause and celebration because they knew all of them had been privileged in this moment to see history made. They would always remember it. And many tried to flow down onto the track to welcome their new hero, Roger Bannister, who had done something that many believed would never be done. Bannister was the toast of the athletic world. But what very few, few people of the, in the grandstand that day realized is that just a few years earlier, Roger Bannister had been a somewhat pudgy little boy. In what we would call his junior high school years, although it was graded a little differently in the UK, he had a coach who said to him, son, you're never going to make it in track and field. You ought to find another sport. But what that coach and no one else seemed to see was that in young Bannister was a burning desire and a robust commitment to do something that no one had ever done before. And he was willing to work at it and apply himself with this commitment no matter how long it took. I want to ask you to do something right now. If you have anything to write with, if you're taking notes on the back of your bulletin, and of course all the godly people are... No, seriously, if, you're, if you've got a device, anything you can put these words on, humor me here. I want you to write down two words, please. They're so important. The words are patience and perseverance. Would you please write those down? Or if you don't have anything to write with, please etch them in your mind. Patience. Perseverance. That's essentially what allowed Bannister to do what he did. A robust commitment anchored, anchored in patience and perseverance. Now we're in a series on better disciples. I hope you know that the mission of Grace Fellowship, oh, we eat, breathe, sleep, pray, bleed this mission. Just Bring it up, and we love to talk about it. It's to glorify God by making more and better disciples. And for the month of August, the spotlight is going on that better part. What does a better disciple look like? And we're using the relationship between the Apostle Paul and Timothy as a sort of case study for us. Now, I wish we had time to do a long review. We do not. But I want to highlight a couple of things that we've seen that are uber important. We've seen the power of parents and grandparents sowing gospel seeds. And I hope that's an enormous encouragement to all of you parents out there and grandparents that you will not let up in sowing good seeds in the lives of your children and grandchildren. When you sow Good seeds, by faith, if the soil is good, you are likely to reap an enormous harvest of righteousness. 
But we've also seen in this series, especially last week, if you'll remember, that Paul sets the bar high. You see, Timothy was not a superstar disciple. So in that sense, I can relate to him. Many of you can. Because we don't feel like we are either, do we? We're not naturally courageous. And yet Paul reminds him God's not given us a spirit of fear, but of power, of love, and of self-discipline. So do not be ashamed, Timothy, to testify about our Lord, or ashamed of me, his prisoner. Don't shrink back like a wilting flower. Be strong like a good soldier. I think Timothy heard that with a lump in his throat. But today, we're going to see that Paul lays it on again just as vigorously as before as he talks about robust commitment and what that looks like in the life of a disciple. And he changes the metaphor here from a soldier to an elite athlete. Look at verse 5 here. He says, similarly, if anyone competes as an athlete, if Timothy got a lump in his throat when Paul said you need to be like a good soldier... I think he got a knot in his stomach when he said you need to be like an athlete. And we all know that ultimate success for any athlete hinges not on just a month or two of commitment. It hinges on a robust commitment that often lasts many, many years. Now when Paul wrote this, I have no doubt that he was thinking of the Greek games which were so popular in the ancient world. They were not called the Olympic Games in those days. That is a phrase that we in the modern world have attached to it. But the ancient equivalent of our Olympic Games were the Greek Games. As athletes would commit themselves to at least, get this, at least 10 months of strict discipline before the Games... And we're told by historians that if an athlete was not willing to subject himself to that kind of rigorous discipline, you couldn't even qualify to be a part of the Greek games. So Paul says, hey, Timothy, being a disciple of Jesus is kind of like that. If you're going to excel, if you're going to be effective, if you're going to be a true disciple, It's going to require the kind of robust commitment and discipline of an elite athlete. So, today I want to highlight two things about an athlete that are super relevant to us as disciples of Jesus. And then we're going to wrap up by highlighting one other metaphor that Paul brings up. Here we go. The first is that a disciple lives according to the rules. According to the rules. Let's look at verse 5 again. Similarly, if anyone competes as an athlete, he does not receive the victor's crown unless he competes according to the rules. Now, everyone knows that sports would quickly become meaningless if there was not an established set of rules. It would just be ridiculous if everybody was kind of making up their own rules for the sport. It becomes so frustrating, it is infuriating. And you just go, what's the point? Unless there are rules and we play by those rules, what's the point of the game? And so when Paul mentions rules here, please understand, he's not talking about a sort of legalism that suggests we can make ourselves acceptable to God by rule keeping. I really want to zero in on this. I want to make sure you understand this. Paul's not saying, now Timothy... Do you want to go to heaven when you die? Now, you be a good little Christian now. You keep the rules, Timothy, because you want to be sure that when you die, your good deeds have outweighed your bad deeds. Be a good rule keeper. Not only is that not what he's saying, that is antithetical to what Paul is saying. It's antithetical to what the Bible teaches. And yet, that's the popular understanding out there today. In fact, I I would even challenge you. I wish someone would take me up on this challenge. Go out in the Capital District, pick strangers at random, and say, hey, I'm doing a little survey. 
I just want to know what your opinion is. That's all. There's no right or wrong answers here necessarily as far as the survey goes. I just want to know your opinion on what Christianity teaches about how a person gets to heaven. You know what you'll find? If you stop people in the capital district at random on the street, they'll probably say in different words something like this. Well, it teaches that you got to be a good person. You got to be good enough to go to heaven. You really need to keep all the rules of Christianity and all the moral things and all that. And hopefully by the time you die, your good deeds outweigh your bad deeds and you get to go to heaven. That's what 95% of the people in the capital district would probably answer. Are you listening to me? That's garbage. Good people don't go to heaven. Forgiven people go to heaven. Forgiven people. You say, wait a minute, pastor. Are you saying that Christians aren't good people? Oh, once they've been forgiven, once they've been saved by the grace of God, of course, we subjectively become better people. Yeah. But we're actually becoming better not to earn God's favor, but out of gratitude for what God has already done for us. I hope you understand that. And if you don't, please read Romans, Galatians, Ephesians, and Titus, which will give you the clear message that we're saved not by works of righteousness, but by the grace and mercy of Almighty God. That's what Jesus' death on the cross is all about. His death means that my sins can be forgiven. And as Luther said, on a life I did not live, on a death I did not die, I hang my whole eternity. And yet, once we're saved, there is a code of conduct, a code of discipline that we live according to the rules. Earlier, we looked at verse 2. And Paul said, the things you've heard me say in the presence of many witnesses, entrust to reliable men and women who will also be qualified to teach others. In other words, this apostolic doctrine, Timothy, that you got from me, you pass it on. With all the T's crossed, with all the I's dotted, you can't change it now. You received it, and by the way, in chapter 1, verse 14, he said, guard the good deposit that was entrusted to you. What does that mean? The good deposit is the gospel. The basics of Christianity, you received it, you guard it. Don't let it be changed by heretics and people who want to water it down because some of it is so politically incorrect. You keep it pure, and then you pass it on. That's what we so desperately need today. And it's not just a corpus of beliefs. It's also a code of behavior. What he's saying here is you can't just make up your own version of Christianity. You can't just take the parts you want and leave out the parts you don't want. You say, but Pastor Rex, what about all the denominations out there? Aren't there groups of Christians that are kind of doing their own thing and making up their own stuff? Well, that's a wonderful question. Let's talk about it. You need to understand that there are many, many what are called denominations. These are groups of believers. And all the orthodox denominations would agree on all the essentials of the gospel, what it means to be saved and so on. And the Jesus' death and resurrection is the basis for that and salvation is by grace through faith. We agree on all that. But denominations are, hear this, conviction clusters. When you get beyond those foundations of essentials, then there are all kinds of secondary and tertiary issues that are conviction kinds of things, and we tend to disagree on those. Let me give you a few examples. Presbyterians are called Presbyterians because they agree on a Presbyterian style of church polity, and they tend to cluster around the teachings of John Calvin. Baptists are called Baptists because they believe in believer's baptism only and in baptism by the mode of full immersion. So they're Baptists. Methodists were dubbed Methodists because as followers of John Wesley, solid in the gospel as they could be, 
They had a very methodological way, a very disciplined way of approaching personal piety. They had Bible studies and they had devotions and they read their Bibles and they prayed every day and they shared their faith and they had accountability where they confessed their sins. And went, wow, they're Methodist. And that was a derogatory statement, but it stuck. And a denomination got started because they clustered around certain convictions. Nazarenes are a denomination that clusters around the belief that God actually wants us to live a holy life. And by his spirit, he sanctifies us holy. He wants to, us to be positively distinctive from the world. I could go on and on and on for an hour here. There are 64 different Protestant denominations in the capital district alone. Trust me, they will never go away until Jesus returns and shows us that we're all wrong, okay? They'll never go away. Don't be mad at denominations. Just get happy about it. We're always going to tend to cluster around our convictions because we naturally want to be around people who tend to agree with us on certain things. But you can't just make up your own version of Christianity. That's the point. You got to live according to the rules, the guidelines given in Scripture, you can't say, hey, uh, I think I'll take some joy and some peace in my heart. And yeah, that fire insurance, that's a really biggie for me. Let me get a big heaping of that on my plate. But you know what? I don't want to care about peace. I know Jesus did and we're supposed to be like him. But I, I, that's too inconvenient for me. And I don't want to be concerned about people who don't know Jesus either. So that's just, I don't have time for that. You can't do that. If you're a disciple of Jesus, you live according to the corpus of beliefs and you live according to the code of behavior. One of my most exciting moments in all the Olympic Games, and I try to watch them every time they roll around. I can hardly wait for the Olympics to come. The most exciting sprint event I've ever seen in my life was the 100-meter final in the Seoul Olympics 1988. I've never seen human beings run as, run as fast in my life. Ben Johnson won the race. Nine point something seconds. Unbelievable. And he was the toast of the athletic world. It was unbelievable. No one had ever seen a human run this fast. It was a world record. And one paper said, Ben Fastic. And that, that word stuck and it just went viral all over the world. Ben Fastic. But three days later, it was discovered that Ben Johnson had used illegal performance-enhancing drugs. His medal was taken, his title was stripped, and it was given to Carl Lewis, who was the runner-up. And Ben Johnson discovered a painful lesson. If you do not compete according to the rules, you're wasting your time. You know, if there was one discipline... I could get everybody at Grace Fellowship to do. You know what it would be? Here it is. We're just having a little family talk here. If there's one thing I could get everybody to do. It would be to read your Bible. That's it. And preferably, not to read it just on your own, but preferably to read your Bible in the presence of someone else who could also Help with understanding it. As the Ethiopian nobleman said, how can I understand unless someone helps me, right? We all need some help. And so maybe it's a group of three and you read the Bible. Maybe one of you is a little further down the road. Or maybe it's in a small group where you've got a, a group leader who teaches and facilitates and, and helps people as they read scripture together. That's what I would do. You know why? Because that's where you get the code. It's only as you open your own Bible up and read Scripture and bathe your life in it that you really get the ethos and the pathos of God's Word and apply it to your life day by day. If there's one thing I could do, it would be to get you to actually crack open your Bible and read it. I know many of you do. Praise God. Keep it up. Keep going. But if you're not in the habit of that, that will change your life. The second, and I'm reading into this just a bit, 
but it's elsewhere all over the New Testament, is that a disciple works in partnership. In other words, Christianity, discipleship is not a solo sport. Even if you're a lone runner in athletics, you still have a team, don't you? You have trainers and coaches and physicians that are a part of your team. The writer of Hebrews chapter 12 verse 1 says, Therefore, since we have so great a cloud of witnesses surrounding us, let us also lay aside every encumbrance and the sin which so easily entangles us and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. In this context, of course, that cloud of witnesses, chapter 11, is all those women and men of faith who've gone before us. They've already run their race. They've already finished. And the writer says now it's like they're in the celestial grandstands, as it were, cheering us on, saying, woo, way to go. Come on, keep pressing in. It's going to be worth it. Don't grow weary. And that encouragement is like spiritual oxygen for our lungs where we're getting tired in this marathon of life. We need that. Who's on your team? As Paul writes 2 Timothy, if you read this letter carefully, especially in chapter 4, you'll see all kinds of people he starts listing there, a whole string of them that are a part of his team. He names people like Crescens, and Titus, and Tychicus, and Carpus. And then he mentions Mark, and Priscilla, and Aquila. And he mentions Pudens, and Linus, and Claudia. And then he just says, and all the brothers. There's a whole bunch of people he's in partnership with because Paul understands you don't run this race alone. We need people around us. So let me ask you today, are you a disciple of Jesus Christ? You're going to run into some times in your life where you're going to see firsthand how desperately crucial it is to have people around you, partners in ministry, partners in life, brothers and sisters who care about you and love you to come alongside. To me, one of the most moving moments in Olympic history happened in Barcelona in 1992. I can hardly watch this clip without choking up every time. I've, I've tried to get myself ready today so I can talk after it, but it moves me. And it's a clip of Derek Redmond running the 400 meter. He was the champion of Great Britain and one of the favorites to win the Olympics in this event. But as he pulls up injured, his father comes down out of the stands. I want us to watch this clip together. Tom Havan and Craig Mass back, back at Olympic Stadium in Barcelona, coming up to the men's 400 meter semifinals. Here are the lane assignments. Steve Lewis in lane three. Top four to Wednesday's final. Steve Lewis in lane three. Roberto Hernandez out quickly in four. Now down the back stretch. Ismael on the left of the screen is running very, very quickly. And inside of Lewis, Sunday Bada of Nigeria. And Derek Redmond of Great Britain has pulled up with an injury. Redmond is out. Derek Redmond, the British record holder and an important member of that British 4x400 four meter relay team as he doesn't want anybody to help him. It'll be Lewis to win in 44.50. Look at this. He's going to try to finish his semifinal race. The British have a certain tradition of running, which you have to respect. A bizarre finish to this first semifinal in the men's 400 meters. Derek Redmond of Great Britain pulled up with an injury halfway down the back stretch. He's fighting off those trying to help him to finish the race in his lane. 
And now the pain too much. swelling throughout Olympic Stadium as Redmond with assistance this time approaches the finish line he had wanted so desperately to reach. That is the Olympic spirit. And I'm moved by the fact that Derek's father literally broke through the crowd, broke through the ropes, literally broke the rules because he loved his son so much he had to be there by his side to help him. Hey, let me ask you a question. As you're running your race, who's gonna be there with you? Oh, you may not pull a hamstring like Derek, but you're going to get a broken heart, I assure you, sometime you will. You may not blow out an Achilles tendon, but you're going to be under some financial stress. You may not fall and twist your ankle, but you're going to have some relational pain. And what I'm asking is, of course, your father is going to be there to undergird you and nurture you, but who do you have around you right now in community, people with skin on them? who can be there with you. The Christian life was not meant to be lived alone. And then he moves here to another metaphor. And I'm gonna ask you to write this down. We've seen that the disciple lives according to the rules and that the disciple works in partnership. But third, and this is not on your note sheet, but it'll be on the screens, a disciple sows good seeds expecting a harvest. Sows good seeds, expecting a harvest. Verse 6. The hardworking farmer should be the first to receive a share of the crops. Now, obviously, Paul is changing metaphors here from a soldier to an elite athlete and now to a hardworking farmer. I don't know how much Paul knew about farming. I don't. But I do know this. He uses this metaphor, or he has allusions to farming numerous times in his writings. One of the best known is Galatians 6, where he says, a man reaps what he sows. My goodness, that's one of the basic laws of arable farming. If you want to harvest, guess what? You better put some good seed in the ground, and it better be good soil. And then he says in chapter 6, verse 9, let us not become weary in doing good. For at the proper time, we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. Farmers sow. They fertilize. They water unless it comes naturally in the weather. And farmers are always working and waiting. Working and waiting. They don't do nothing while they wait. They go on with other kinds of work, but after sowing and fertilizing, without, after cultivating and watering, they work and they wait, and they work and they wait. At the beginning of this message, I ask you to write down two words. You remember them? Patience and perseverance. And just like a farmer has to have enormous patience and perseverance before the harvest comes... The disciple of Jesus is the same. Let us not become weary in doing good. Now, to be brutally honest, that's hard, isn't it? Some of you get up every day. You're going to get up tomorrow morning. You're going to hit work again. You're going to have a little prayer time. You're going to devote yourself to the Lord all over again. That's wonderful. And then you're going to go to a job. Now, hopefully, 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 you have a job you enjoy. I hope you do. I hope you know also that you're in the minority if you really enjoy your work. 80% of Americans on survey say, I hate my job. 
It's not something they look forward to. Their job is a drain to them. It depletes them. And you grow so weary of that, don't you? It's hard to be patient and persevere. And you look at your own life and you think, I ought to be getting better than this. It's three steps forward, two steps back, like we talked about last week. Or then you parents, you look at your parenting and you go, this has got to be the hardest thing God ever created. You look at your kids and you try to train them and teach them well and you try to nurture them and mentor them, but then you see them making some bad decisions and you think, wow, how much of this is on me? And you feel guilty And it's just a drudgery sometimes day after day for many. I'm telling you today, there comes a time when we need some spiritual oxygen in our lungs. There comes a time when we need to remember that discipleship is a long obedience in the same direction. It is not a sprint. It is a marathon. And patience and perseverance are the only way to finish this race. You Keep sowing those gospel seeds. You keep doing the right thing. You keep doing what you know to do. One of the prize exhibits of the Egyptian Museum in Cairo, Egypt, is some of the contents of the tomb of Tutankhamun, who was a pharaoh who died 3,500 years ago. Tutankhamun was only 18 years old when he died of some illness. And he'd only been Pharaoh for a short time. And you know the custom in Egypt in those days. It was to meticulously embalm the Pharaoh. But then he was buried in an elaborate tomb with all these accoutrements. They would put things in there they believed he would need in the afterlife that would be able to go with him. And so they put in horses and chariots. They put in that tomb even soldiers. And to accompany him on his journey he had all kinds of gold and jewelry and clothing it was amazing but when archaeologists discovered Tutankhamun's tomb in the 1920s they were astounded to see barrels and barrels of seed buried there all kinds of seeds grain mostly different grains and it looked like Every seed had been carefully washed and even polished with something. Placed in the barrel and then sealed up for 3,500 years. And of course, the question on everybody's mind is, will these seeds grow? Well, they planted some of them and sure enough, with some patience and perseverance, they sprouted, they germinated, they grew Because a seed is a powerful thing. Brothers and sisters in Christ, I don't know how weary you may be today, but I want you to know that true discipleship requires a robust commitment. It is a long obedience in the same direction. And if you keep sowing good seed in an obedient heart, I tell you, On the authority of God's word, you are going to reap a big old harvest one day. So keep on going. And your heart will brim with gratitude at how good God is on this journey of life. Father, thank you for your goodness to us. Thank you that you've called us and set the bar high. You've asked us to be like a good soldier. You've challenged us to be like an elite athlete. You've told us to be like a hard-working farmer with patience and perseverance. And Father, by your grace, we can be all these things. I ask that you would strengthen us this day. And for all the people who truly call you Lord, that this would be a day of great encouragement and that we would leave here knowing that being a disciple of Jesus is the grandest call in the world. In Jesus' name we pray, amen and amen.